Hello and welcome to the next Open UK Future Leaders training session. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be available soon afterwards on our YouTube channel. First, a little about the Open UK Future Leaders Group. The Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding and innovation, as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. It operates under the direction of the Open UK's Legal and Policy Committee and has a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. The Future Leaders Group is currently co-chaired by me, Robert Grinnells, and I'm from Phil Fisher, and Katie Gibson from Bristow's, and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and to new members, whether getting involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects, so please do get in contact if you'd like to get involved. And for today's session, we're privileged to be joined by Deb Nicholson. Deb is a free software policy expert and a passionate community advocate, and is currently the general manager at the Open Source Initiative. The OSI stewards the open source definition, so I think you'll agree with me she's a great speaker to have with us to talk about the challenges that it faces as we approach the 30th anniversary of open source in 2021. Deb was previously the Director of Community Operations at the Software Freedom Conservancy and remains part of the Conservancy community, most formally as, more formally as a volunteer on their evaluation committee. We'll have a chance for any questions at the end, so please do pop them in the chat box and we'll invite you on to voice and video to ask them yourself if you'd like to. Deb, welcome to our session today, and thanks for joining us. And over to you to talk about the OSI. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so, uh, oops, you'll get to see a little preview of all the slides. So there. Uh, so uh, as Robert said, I'm the general manager at the Open Source Initiative. I've just been there for a couple of months, although I've been a, a member for a while. and uh, I have been uh, working in free and open source software for um, almost 15 years now. So I started at the Free Software Foundation. I'm based here in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where uh, free software was born, actually. So uh, that's our website and our Twitter account and my own Twitter account. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, I mean, the computers and software have been with us for a long time. Um, and one of the things that I think, uh, you know, we, we get pretty focused on what's new and, uh, and some of the things that are with us, it, uh, have been with us for a long time. So if you take a look here, this is some of the first computers. Um, yeah, so there are the four ladies with the, with their, with the motherboard, some, some very massive, expensive computers that, uh, by default came with free software, free as in cost, because no one would have charged for the software in those days. So, all right. Um, so I, I just thought it would be interesting to kind of place some of the history of free and open source software in context. You can see what kind of machines we were talking about. So those massive machines, like I said, as a default came with like software that was just sort of an extra. Um, and then this machine in 1985, this is, this is what people had on their desks at home when the free software movement was, uh, started in 1985. So like Richard Stallman started the free software movement when people were starting to have computers in their homes and they were starting to want to do things with them. They were starting to want to do things with them that didn't have anything to do with work. They wanted to like play around or tinker. It wasn't like uh, the way that people were starting to interact with computers was uh, starting to be a, l a little bit more um, like, you know, weird, like whatever they wanted. Um, and people wanted to start to build things that the manufacturers of the computers had not imagined them doing. And so, uh, so in 1985, Richard Stallman, um, he was at an academic institution, MIT, uh, not so far from here actually, um, and, and got really frustrated with, um, having to only get software from the manufacturer and not being able to tailor it, tinker with it, collaborate, uh, with others and share back the changes. So, um, so moving on to 1998, so while in the hobbyist world and the academic community, uh, free software took off, it ended up um, helping us build the uh, all the GNU tools and the Linux software and all those kinds of things. Um, the OSI uh, began in 1998 and it was an effort to bring all of that like goodness of the collaboration and the sharing and improving on stuff um, and 
you know, helping people use software better. Um, in 1998, we decided, hey, like, let's make this, let's bring this back to the business community. <clears throat> One of the things that the business community is is not usually so keen on is free stuff. So, um, so we had to do a little bit of a remarket there. So, open source really focuses on the collaborative model of building software and um, that way of making kind of the base software, the um, platform available to everybody to build on. And so. Uh, so the OSI was born in 1998, and that's when we were using these kinds of, uh, you know, disks, which you've probably found in uh, the backs of file cabinets if you've ever worked somewhere that's been around for a really long time. Um, going forward to, like, 2016, so we had, if you remember, those massive computers that uh, you had to pay so much for. Uh, in 2016, the $5 smartphone was invented. Uh, was given to the world. And so, uh, like, I wouldn't put this in your back pocket, uh, but it is a fully functioning smartphone, and it runs on nearly 100% free software and open source software. So, uh, so as we go from, like, large to small, uh, from something that you would only have in the giant room at work with a government clearance to something that anyone can buy, anyone who's got $5 or anyone who's got a friend with $5, can buy, uh, technology becomes more and more accessible. And um, the impact of this $5 smartphone in India where it was introduced is massive. Um, just having, going from no connectivity to the internet to having it in your pocket is an amazing, powerful force. So, um, so that's just kind of like, we, that's just from 1945 to 2016. We went from massive room-sized computers to like, a Tic Tac box that uh, has a computer in it. So uh, there's our there's our timeline just to kind of put this all in context. And um, so uh, just like two years ago, the Open Source Initiative celebrated its 20th anniversary, um, and we've done a lot of different things over the years. Um, it's uh, it's been a long ride, like 20 years, as you can see, uh, can make a huge difference in the technology timeline. So today we work on uh, protecting and stewarding the open source definition, which defines what open source is. We maintain that, um, and we answer questions about it. We sometimes we have vigorous conversations about it, um, but that is uh, part of our mission. Uh, we also maintain a list of open source licenses, uh, and that list, uh, well, it grows in fits and starts. Some years nobody wants to write new licenses, and then you stumble across a year where everyone wants to write new licenses, um, and it follows some of the changes in the way that we combine different types of software and the uh, the things that are available. I expect that we'll start getting uh, licenses that touch on the issue of AI in the next year or two. Um, uh, we're certainly already starting to get ones that uh, touch on cryptography and touch on the idea of uh, how interrelated the data is with the software. And then we're also working to shepherd the future of open source. So um, over the years, we've been different degrees of proactive or reactive, and this is one of those moments where I feel like we want to be really proactive. There's a lot of policy conversations going on around what the future of open source will be. Um, we're finally starting to chip in on some of those conversations about procurement. Um, the EU is a little ahead of the US on that one. Um, but uh, we, wanna, we wanna see open source go as far as it can go and, and be everywhere it can be. So why does it matter? Why do we care if it's open source? Um, so at first, uh, I would say open source saves us a lot of time. Like it saves developers and people working to solve solutions with software a lot of time. And that's really exciting because uh, it can take a really long time to build every single tool in the stack. So you don't have to do that. Like you don't have to, if you have an idea for something that you want to build and it needs a database and a web framework, you don't have to make a database and you don't have to make a web framework. You just go and pick one. Um, once the, you know, the general structure is there, you can kind of riff on it and build what you want to build, make whatever you want to make. 
uh, and just kind of add the part that makes it a little bit different or a little bit more interesting or makes it fit your needs a little bit better. Uh, you can automate more things. Once you have decided what you want to do, what you want to build, what kind of software, uh, you know, is your, your dream, uh, you know, you're, you're going to want to automate some things because, well, there are a lot of things out there. But the great thing about open source is that there are structures that you can borrow that other folks have already built for automation, which is fantastic because that also helps you save time. Uh, and then your security team is basically everyone who uses the same code base as you which is fantastic. So one person or entity finds a security vulnerability and it gets shared with everybody else who works on that software or uses that software or depends on that software. Um, the, in, you know, we used to say the many eyes shallow bugs and for a little while uh, that was true because everyone used all the same stuff and then we kind of lost it on a couple of things maybe uh, over the last decade and and that sort of brought everyone back to attention on some of the key pieces that are uh, that are dependent on uh, by lots and lots of different entities. So um, there are now good, robust structures for sharing security vulnerabilities across different open source platforms. So that uh, once you find once you find the leak, you can share it and patch it. And it also means that you may not necessarily have to pay for the patch or develop the patch yourself. If you, especially if you're one of the smaller players operating on that platform. Um, the other thing that's really great is that you don't have to ask for permission. So if you if you know that you want to use Python for your project, like you don't have to wine and dine Guido Van Rossum for a year. You can just go and use Python and all the libraries that are uh, held under the Python Software Foundation's auspices. Like they're all out there on the internet for you to go and take and use. You don't have to um, form relationships. You don't have to be connected. You don't have to know the right people to use the software. It's just there. And I think that's one of the things that's really key about uh, open source and collaborative development is that uh, you know you don't you don't have to have come from the right place or gone to the right school to go ahead and take everything that's out there on a repo and incorporate it in your project, in your software. Uh, it's just, it's there for everyone. So that means that the barrier to entry is lower with open source than it would be for proprietary software. Even if you wanted to develop an application for uh, an Apple phone, you still have to pay to be a developer. You still have to pay to be a registered developer. I mean, I think it's maybe 100 bucks a year, so it's not a huge sum, but, uh, well, it's not a huge sum for us in the U.S. or, or you all in England, but it, it could be a larger sum in other places, and that does make it a barrier sometimes. Uh, so there are lots of people using lots of software for lots of different reasons, and so software that gets built to help one person organize their wine cellar might um, be used for another person by another person to, like, organize their music collection. And so um, that's one of the other things that's interesting too is that like a, a tool that is developed in one place can be used somewhere else. So like maybe the maybe the wine cellar folks had a lot of money to create some software but the record collectors didn't or the other way around, who knows. Um, but uh, they're able to borrow and use and recombine the things that they've built for each other. And so uh, when you've got software that's been built with certain defaults, if it's open source, then you can change those defaults. So um, software that's used in one country uh, may have a certain set of holidays or um, certain defaults. Uh, for instance, in um, people who are Muslim have to have different defaults in their contracts uh, because there are religious constrictions on the types of contracts they can sign. And so you can change these defaults if the code base is available to you. Um, and that means that uh, all different kinds of people can use your software. You can localize it for all different places. Uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting um, is the, the LibreOffice story, um, which used to be called OpenOffice. It's, uh, it's an open source office productivity suite. and um, when 
say maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, Brazil was in a rough spot, financially speaking. Their economy was really uh, in a slump. And so at that time, uh, Microsoft, which does this huge office productivity suite, decided that it probably wasn't worth their time and effort to produce an office productivity suite in Brazilian Portuguese. And so if you wanted to use like spreadsheets and you know word processing documents, uh, in Brazil you had to use them in English until someone said, hey, you know what, like I've, we found this open source office productivity suite we're going to translate it into Brazilian Portuguese so that now people can use things in their native language. And so uh, so there are a lot of people who use free and open source software all over Brazil because they're used to open office and, well, now LibreOffice. And so um, the power to be able to translate something into your local language with your local defaults is is massive. And there are other groups that are a little too niche to be profitable for large software companies, uh, and they can also uh, go ahead and take open source software and tailor it and customize it for their needs. So um, <clears throat> for, uh, for veterinarian offices, they have very different needs than, uh, than human medical records offices. Uh, if you found a tool that, if you were a veterinarian and you found a tool that you like, you would have to change it because, um, well, uh, in <laughs> in human hospitals, we don't ask the uh, patient what species they are, but you definitely need to do that for veterinarian uh, offices because, well, you got to know if you've got a cat or a dog. And so, um, you know, the healthcare industry is is huge and especially huge and expensive here in the U.S. But um, the veterinarian office industry is a little bit smaller. <clears throat> so, uh, so these smaller industries are able to take things from larger industries and customize them and tailor them for their own use, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, again, it's this, uh, like this efficiency of being able to share and then this empowerment of being able to get the software to do the thing that you want in the language that you want. And there are lots of groups that need software, even if they aren't particularly numerous or wealthy. Um, children don't tend to have lots of money, but uh, and it can be sometimes hard to find funding to build really robust and exciting software for uh, for kids. Um, but uh, hopefully that is starting to change a little bit. But uh, I here in the U.S. we um, we had like a whole generation of kids where we were like, "Hey, try Excel." It's, Super fun. Uh, we've been told we should teach kids to use computers. Um, children did not end up inspired by Excel. Uh, so, uh, but now there are starting to be some really fantastic programs uh, for kids to use and software that kids can use, even despite the fact that they don't usually have a lot of spending money. Um, another group of folks that um, you know uh, may not be profitable or numerous enough to always get. Uh, what they need from software is people with disabilities. So the GNOME Foundation, which is a nonprofit, um, has built a, a screen reader that people can use uh, even if they're visually impaired to read things on the internet. So um, instead of like one nation of people or one group of people or one individual uh, having to undertake the task of commissioning software to read screens, uh, they're able to leverage this global community and build on top of existing tools that are themselves open source so that there is a, a robust and uh, well-maintained screen reader for people with uh, visual impairments to use the Internet. Uh, and so, of course, the lower startup cost means that in addition to being able to serve niche groups or smaller groups or less moneyed groups or um, you know, it means that uh, we can also kind of try fun stuff or weird stuff or innovative things. So an idea that might have sounded kind of out there or kind of strange, um, you know, again, doesn't have to start with building the database and the web framework and a programming language. All of those tools are already there. You can go right to the little weird bits and the things that people look at and they're like, I don't really know what that does or I don't know why I would want that yet. But without having to build all the other things, you can go 
you know, you can get right to the weird bits or the innovative bits. And I think that's really exciting. It means that some of the problems that we don't know how to solve yet, um, you don't have to get a, a large, maybe dodgier company to look at the solutions. Someone uh, on their own, someone closer to the problem uh, can take a look at how they might go about doing it and combine some of the existing tools to see if they might find a solution to some of these problems. Um, so uh, that brings us to interoperability, which um, which actually solves a lot of problems. Um, interoperability is, uh, you know, when software is all interoperates. Um, but it isn't the default, unfortunately. There is a lot of code that you would hope would talk to other code, but then it doesn't. Um, and, and it can cause delays. Uh, a really fantastic example is the Sahana Foundation's open source disaster management software. So what, uh, what they do is in the wake of a hurricane or a tsunami or some other kind of uh, disaster, they take a look at what people are using to communicate currently and then build those little bridges so that all of the different silos through which information is coming in and going out can be connected. They're not connected by default, but in the wake of a disaster, you really need everything to be able to talk to everything else. It's absolutely critical to know where people are, how many people are in each location, how much food, water, and shelter is needed in each location. Um, and not sending stuff or not hearing from people and sending water and shelter uh, can can make the difference between life and death for people. It's um, you need that mission, you need that information to be able to not encounter any barriers in the wake of a disaster. And so, so they've worked on this in a number of different places, and they have uh, a lot of different tools built. But um, well, disasters wouldn't be disasters if we knew they were coming. So um, they're ready and at the you know like kind of at the ready to be deployed wherever a, a new uh, problem arises and a new situation arises. Um, OpenMRS is the, uh, it's a medical record system. So this is also about like open standards and um, pushing for there to be like a single standard for medical records. Uh, and it's not hard to imagine a situation where uh, you, you know, well, <laughs> Today, we probably aren't going to be traveling too far from our homes. But when you do travel uh, or you are not at home, if you end up in a hospital that is not your home hospital and not your home hospital system, you want the medical records that are received by that hospital to be current and to be readable and parsable by that uh, institution. Um, you know, you, you may have allergies, you may have like medications that you need to take or condition that is important for the doctor treating you in that uh, hospital to know about. And if they can't access your records easily and well, then, uh, and you're uh, perhaps sadly unable to uh, do a good job of advocating for yourself, um, again, this could, this could make the difference between survival or not. So, uh, so interoperability is is critically important for lots of different reasons, and these I've just chosen a couple of um, you know big ones. Um, privacy and anonymity. This is another place where software uh, makes a difference. Uh, it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Um, being able to have like privacy and anonymity software that you can depend on, that is robust, that's been uh, well investigated and well understood is is super important. So the tour, it was just the onion router. Um, this allows people to surf the internet without being tracked by their government or by anybody else. And so um, it's it's not, well, it's not it's the case in the U.S. or I think in England where you can't uh, look at the internet um, freely. But there are definitely countries where this is a problem. Uh, being able to access information in places like China or North Korea um, is a huge problem. And so the Onion Router allows people to look at things anonymously and to access information without being tracked. Uh, Secure Drop is a tool for 
whistleblowers to talk to authorities or to talk to journalists without uh, being tracked. So it's open source encryption, and it's a whole tool where um, people can upload information that uh, that they need to upload without being found out. So that a, a like a secret source can actually remain secret without um, leaving their fingerprints all over the, the information that they needed to share. So, so that's, that's the path, that's the excitement, that's, um, that's why we do this, uh, the open source software, and why I think it's so important. Um, maybe you're wondering how to get started, or I assume you're here, you're already started, maybe you're wondering how to get more involved. There are loads of resources. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> one of the things that I think is really uh, fascinating and interesting about open source software is that there are, there are lots of chatty people that wanna uh, that wanna help you get wherever you're going. Uh, and so some of those resources, I'll share some resources, and then we can talk more at the end. We're getting to the end of the part where I'm going to talk at you. Um, so for students, there's the the outreach program, which is a paid internship. Uh, where you can work on uh, free and open source software and get paid for three months to do so. Uh, the interesting thing about the Outreachy program is that it's not only code. Like there are other projects around like um, documentation or writing or promotion and testing and translation too. Uh, first timers only, if you're not already a coder, that's a place where you can find uh, small bugs specifically designed for first timers to go ahead and solve. The uh, open source technology management program at Brandeis is open source classes that you can take. Um, they're micro courses, just like four sessions and then like a wrap up uh, to learn about how to do uh, technology management in the open source field. So, you know, lots of conversations about licensing and business models and things like that. And then open edX is another place where you can, uh, it's, it itself is open source software, but it also uh, has all of these courses from uh, big institutions like MIT and Harvard where you can learn to code. Um, for educators, there's the Teaching Open Source Program, which has curricula. And uh, Open at RIT is also working on building curricula for um, college level uh, educators that want to teach open source. And then I mentioned Microblocks to uh, Amanda earlier. I think it's so fun. Um, that's a great program for kids to learn hardware and software. And then uh, I put Python here. There, I, I didn't pick any one specific resource because there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of resources to teach kids Python. Um, for lawyers, and I know you've got some lawyers in the group, the License Discuss mailing list at the Open Source Initiative is where we, we talk about licenses and we talk about uh, interoperability between licenses. And there are also legal networks of lawyers in uh, different locations to do that too. Uh, and then just general, I would say the uh, Forge Your Future with Open Source, this is a book by VM Purser, which has a lot of how to get started in open source and how, like from the beginning, from your first patch, all the way to how to kind of, and then opensource.com, which is hosted by Red Hat, has, a, a, has lots of articles on open source, like, um, if there's new licenses, they'll talk about it there too. Um, if there is, you know, if you need to, like, what are the 10 tools that people are using um, in the CRM space for that are open source? They have a constant uh, flow of articles on those kinds of topics. And of course, there's meetups, I'm sure you knew that, and forums and virtual events and mailing lists. Uh, my caveat on mailing lists is check the archives first and see if you want those folks in your inbox. Um, very, many, many, many mailing lists are great. A couple, just a couple or not. Uh, and then find the folks who are doing the kinds of things you want to do. Uh, which, and, and then like follow them on Twitter or, uh, you know, go to their website and see what they're writing about. Um, there's this huge, vast network of people doing open source, and people love to talk about it, like I said, and they love to share what they know. Um, and so, you know, I've, I often tell people that 
you if you know like exactly who you want to be when you grow up and it's basically like you know say Amanda like just tell her and see if she'll do a virtual coffee with you or something uh, so find your piece of the pie there uh, that you want to work on and and go for it uh, there's uh, there are so many resources out there and so many places that you can plug in um, if you want to do open source and learn more about uh, any aspect, whether it's the software or the business models or the licenses. So I have picture credits, uh, of course, um, because we give people credit. And then um, I would be happy to take some questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Deb. That was a great talk on uh, open source and the OSI. Yes, as Deb said, um, open for questions. Uh, I think Amanda has already jumped up and is ready to talk. So, yeah, please go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always have loads of questions for Deb. Um, <laughs> So, Deb, I suppose from an organizational perspective, how do we get onto your slide with the kids camp is my first question. Oh, yeah. Just tell me. OpenUK.UK backslash Open Kids Camp. And yeah, then, um, OK. Open Kids Camp. And then the, the second question is, what do you think is the cause of the perceived gap in participation in a certain age group, and how do you think we change that for future generations? So I know Rob McQueen is on the call as well, and we were talking the other night about how a lot of the folk who are both the, the key developers and the community people and the people bringing the infrastructure together are now hitting a certain age, and there is a mm -hmm. gap, and then we see younger people coming in, but how is it that we engage those younger people more? What do we need to do? Well. I'm myself not a, a particularly young person, so I have some ideas, but, uh, you know, maybe on a future uh, episode of this, we'll have, you'll have an actually younger person. Uh, but one of the things that I did see, um, so, and I'm not going to name the project because I don't want to call them out, but uh, I was talking to somebody, um, they had been working on the same software project for about 20 years, and he said to me, you know, I would love to have some more people help me build this software, but I just have been having trouble finding anyone who's worthy. And I was like, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> um, so in, immediately I got, I was like, so you were looking for someone who is basically you, like, you know, except without their own project and instead they just want to work on your project, like a not evil twin or something. And um, so I, I think one of the big things that we have trouble doing is delegating. And, uh, and we just have to get a lot better at that. And that means not being like, here's my weird collection of tasks that I've been doing for the last five years. Now they are all yours. It means breaking them down into like 25 or 30 little tasks and then finding a whole lot of people who want to try one or two. Um, and, it's, and, and it's hard. Like, I think when you build, uh, especially if the software that you're building is kind of a passion project for you as well, like something that is like tightly related to your sense of self and who you are in the world and what you get done, um, it can feel really, you know, it can feel like, I don't know, like giving someone your toothbrush to delegate a piece of your work, but we have to get over that. Like, we really, really have to get over that. Um, and I'll tell you, like, once you try delegating things, um, and you might have a couple clunkers, like, not everyone is uh, who says, like, hey, I think I want to do this, um, ends up following through. You have to kind of play the odds. Um, but once you do get a couple of folks that want to take on a little bit, uh, it, it can be really amazing to see what you're able to accomplish by keeping your hands out of the day-to-day -day on every single thing. So I think that is sort of the challenge for open source projects is to um, let people in, let people help, and give them a small piece. Like if you have an amazing person who's been doing work at your project for like 20 years and then they retire, like you're not going to find a new Sarah you have to like take what Sarah was doing and break it down into a whole bunch of small pieces and see if you might take a chance on like 20 new Sarahs. 
I think that's that's really true and really accurate. And it's, it's one of the things that when I actually look at sort of um, trying to contribute, because I'm not a coder kind of by background, I kind of just I'm strong with IT, but I'm a lawyer kind of thing. And um, like, I didn't know about the like the first timers only site I was looking at in the background while we were talking. I didn't realize, and that's a great thing to know. Actually, there are it is really intimidating. You kind of look at these enormous projects. I have no idea how I could contrib contribute. How how can I be useful? Uh, these these amazing people running this stuff. How on earth can I contribute to this fantastic thing? And yeah, knowing that there is a there is a way in. Um, yeah, definitely, it's really important. Really it's important. interesting you mentioned the um, non coding too. I like because projects have sometimes asked me like, how do I get non coders to help? And I'm like, well, what does it say on your website about what you need help with? And they're like, huh. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so like if we need help with translating or we need help with documentation or we need help with testing or, you know, or whatever it is, like you put that in like on your website somewhere because there's maybe you don't have it and maybe not on a repo like deep down uh, where it says like, oh, here bug number 247 that's been open for three years. We could also use some non-coders like that's not the right place. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, Debs and Rob, because, uh it's one of the reasons the Future Leaders Group is important is that the governance piece matters in the community and having community leaders and having governance is essential for a project to do well. And mm. actually, when we looked around the room in February, um, I'm not a little bit old, I'm actually quite old now. And uh, <laughs> you know what, someday I'm gonna retire. Um, Never. What, what we realized <laughs> is there was nobody in the room who was under 40. Mm -hmm. And that was why we, we realized we needed to do something about this legal group and make sure that we got lawyers involved. So that was why we started with lawyers and it's broadened out and there's developers and things involved now too. But Rob, you're, you're actually, you, you don't maybe think of it, but you are already as co-chair of this group contributing massively to the community. That's a terrifying thought, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, do we have any other questions from uh, everyone else on the line? You don't have to come on voice and video. If you want to just stick it in the chat, feel free. Um, but uh, I, I will happily read it if you'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, another, I was gonna say another thing that folks can do if they want uh, people to come to their community is to make sure that they're always um, providing a space for newcomers. Uh, and so um, it's like, you know, so like the Python Software Foundation, when they have their conference, they have a number of things tagged for newcomers, like a newcomer's welcome lunch or something and um, and that kind of thing. It's, I think uh, when I was doing the Python meetup, we always had a table on the hack night that was for beginners to sit at and there would be like uh, one or two people who already knew what they were doing would also sit there and they'd be like, so what are people working on? What have people tried? Or do you need a suggestion? And they would have like some, like you might wanna try coding that or you might wanna try dive into Python um, and then let me know if you get stuck because I agreed to sit here at the beginners table and help people out. So if you don't have a place for beginners to go, like it can be really intimidating to jump into the deep end of the pool and be like, oh no, am I supposed to know what that is? And you're just furiously looking up acronyms the whole time everyone's talking. <laughs> um, you know, so if you tell people like here is where, this is what we have for beginners, um, please come, please sit here. And, and, and then telling people that uh, it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to not know things, and trying to remind each other not to use all the acronyms. and. It's pretty you know. really easy. Like if you, if you grew up with it and kind of it developed as you went, you learned it as you went. But it's you don't realize what it's like to be a beginner now when there's this massive body of kind of information that you have to kind of absorb to really kind of be able to do anything. So yeah, Amanda, I think you popped up in case you might yeah, want to ask another question. Buddy, um, I was thinking. So Deb, there's been quite a lot of talk over the last few years about the open source definition. Mm -hmm. um, the, the role the OSI has in that and what the definition does and how it works and whether it should be revisited. I think since you're here today on behalf of the OSI, it'd be really <laughs> great if you could talk a bit more to us about you know what that was all about and why and where you guys are at. Yeah, so I think it's it's interesting because we have been, there has been like, we even kind of got called out on, state, on the big stage at FASDEM earlier this year, like, the open source definition must be updated, um, not by anyone who works here. 
which is interesting, or is, uh, you know, on our board or whatever. But, um, you know, we kind of took that on, like, yes, like, it hasn't been changed in a long time. And it is pretty, um, it's pretty bare bones. Um, and it's, it is really kind of aspirational, kind of mission-based, and maybe not so much implementation-based. Um, I'm not sure that we would change the definition, but I think we might uh, we might be ready to add more um, to the discussion about implementation because we were like some of the new licenses that were proposed last year, and, and one was a troll like trolling or mailing list. Um, they were they were all really different, and it was all like we were like, oh, uh, none of this like we don't have a framework for talking about any of these things, and so. Um, so we kind of, I think we, like, our, our board felt like, wow, that's a, that's, that's a lot to think about. And it's, and the board is actually in the process of doing this kind of strategic planning and, like, what are the next five, ten years of OSI look like? Um, I don't think we're probably going to do too much materially to change the definition, but I do think we want to, like, provide more, like, guidance and framework and kind of um, shepherd more conversations about the implementation because that was just, that was like the canary, right? There's going to be, like, more of those kinds of licenses where we're like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Like, you know, like I mentioned AI, there's going to be licenses where it's like, you know, what about software that's written by software? Uh, I don't know. But we're going to have to answer that question. And what about, like, you know, we we already saw what happens when, like, or we've already started to see what happens when, like, hardware and software get mushed together. Now we're seeing, like, data and software get mushed together. And the hardware and software mush, that's not even done yet. Like, we're, you know, as we're printing things and, you know, so we're having software create hardware, right? Like, what, what does that do to the licensing? And we don't quite know yet, like, how that's going to affect do we have to, we're going to have to do some hard thinking about the implementation of the open source definition on those new areas. So we're, um, I think we got accused a little bit earlier this year of like being like, no new licenses, get off my lawn. And, and it's not the case. Like, I think we are open to new licenses, but they, well, they can't be jokes. Um, uh, they have to be real licenses and they have to be readable and parsable and enforceable. And I, I think that that makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And, um, you know, the definition is obviously a certain age now, as are many of us, but it's what, 30 next year? <laughs> I think it, it could drink beer here in the U.S. Yeah. The drinking age is 21, <laughs> so yeah. Exactly, exactly. So when you look at it, it was created in an environment where everything in the future couldn't be imagined. And if it was to be updated now, the same would happen. So I guess yeah. if it was going to be updated, it would be something that needed to be done continuously. But whether there's any need for that is a totally different question when you look at, you know, is open source open source? Is it something that's uh, distributed on an open source license and meets the OSD? And if it's that and it stays that and it's that forever, there's room for other things, but they are other things and they should be called something different. So there's obviously an important piece about understanding what open source means and making sure that the things called open source truly are. What I, I think is really interesting there is the platform economy and the cloud economy has created a lot of controversy. And I'll give you a get out of jail card by saying that I think that a lot of the controversy has been caused by people wanting to do the right thing and setting up businesses so that people in their community, people in their group could be paid, which they deserve to be. You know, there's, as with yeah. one of the Google founders, who said there's no shame in making money and you have to be able to eat. And don't Packers got to eat. You otherwise, right? So that I totally agree with. But when you look to build a business on open source, the first stage is to understand what open source actually means and then build a business on it. Don't assume open source is a business model. Yeah. And I think there was a real problem for you guys with a perceived backlash against the definition, but actually a lot of that had to do with people's understanding. I don't know how much you can talk about that, but it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about that. You know, the yeah. New York Times talking about strip mining and things like that. I don't know if you can comment. Well, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that, as you say, I mean, um, open source is not a business model. And so, so that leaves this other question of if open source is not a business model, then what is your business model? If you aren't selling the software, then what are you selling? Mm -hmm. And if you aren't, doing a good job of selling the other thing, 
then the software you're giving away for free is not going to bail out your business. Um, so if like, and it could be like the support, it could be the expertise, it could be like the customization, it could be the ability to like write modules and libraries efficiently um, that uh, feed back into that platform. But, uh, you know, or it could just be like, oh, you have the friendliest people and the user experience is amazing. Um, but then, but then you can't like slash that in half when stuff gets tight. So like, if whatever your business model is, you need to know what it is. Like, if you aren't selling the software, you're selling something else and you need to know what that thing is. And if you don't know what that thing is, then, you know, like I said, Selling the software you're giving away for free is not gonna is not gonna be the the bailout. Yeah, and I think that that's important as you understand the transitions into new technologies and something that people have to sit down and really thoroughly understand. And I think yeah. where we got caught out was the transition into the cloud environment, where if you mm -hmm. have a support model that relies on you being paid for services like integration, but you don't need that because you're now in a SaaS environment. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to be stunned. And maybe that's just a natural progression that we'll see as we move into different environments beyond cloud as well. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, there are other niches that you can uh, look at, too, is like, you know, so maybe you're not going to go toe to toe with a, a giant company because they are just going to be a little bit more efficient. But you know, you might be like, oh, for uh, some particular use case, like if you say, uh, oh, we have the cloud, but we have the cloud in a way that automatically strips out EXIF data. So if you are especially worried about security, but you still want to share pictures, um, then we're the place for you to share those pictures. And you can imagine like a kindergarten or elementary school saying, oh, we do want to share pictures but we never want to share locations where children are. Um, so that might be, so you might need to specialize a little bit. You can't, you can't be, I mean, it's like, you know, I sometimes when I've given talks to students, like I'll run into someone at the end and they're like, I want to be the next Steve Jobs. And I'm like, you can't because he already existed. Like you have to be the next something else. And you you can't just like do a like redo. So and and there are a lot of large, like very profitable companies and I can understand being like, you know, I would like to be Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whatever. And it's like those are people who already exist who already did something at a specific point in time that was something that hadn't been done and uh and they were very successful. They identified a niche that wasn't being done. You can't just be Bill Gates again, like 30 years later. Um, so you have to find your own niche and your own thing. You can't, you know, uh, you can't just redo something. And and I think it's folks maybe that can be a little harder to hear. They're like, because everyone wants to armchair quarterback and be like, I could be a better Jeff Bezos than Jeff Bezos. And it's like maybe, but like he's already doing it and he's very successful. And he's not just him. He's like a whole massive uh, entity like company with like a lot of other people. So if you're like you and your friend from college, then you're not going to compete with that. So you have to find a niche that he isn't doing that isn't being done by whatever your competitor is. And, and then you have to do a really good job of that. And there are a lot of niches out there. Like, uh, I gave a talk earlier this year about building ethical software, and there's a ton of people that want to work somewhere that is like environmentally friendly or is like really diverse and really good to their employees and is really good about like letting people go home for dinner and stuff like that. Like there are all these niches. You could build that company, like a humane work environment as a niche, like a company that is not, you know, Boiling the environment as a niche, like there are like tons of niches out there that um, that large companies just cannot do. They're just too big, um, and so so you're gonna have to do that. And then you tell your customers, like, hey, we're the company that you know recycles all our servers, and that's why we cost a little bit more than the giant massive other other company. 
Fantastic. I think that's a fantastic moment to stop there, actually. Uh, that's a great inspirational thing to say at the very end. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that's a great point to start stop there. So thank you so much, Deb. That's a, it was a fantastic talk and a really interesting bit of, a chance to do a bit of QA at the end there. Um, for everyone else, uh, benefit for next week, uh, we have Mike Milankovic, uh, the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation, who will be joining us for his talk. And he'll be talking about the reinvention of the Eclipse Foundation itself. And that, I think, will be our last talk, actually, of uh, 2020. So uh, it'll be a good one to join. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, speak soon. Cheers. Thanks so much, Bye. Robert. Have a great week. Bye.